Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. On behalf of the congregation, I welcome all our visitors. Please join us for morning tea following the service. Thank you. Beloved in Christ, let us worship our God and our Lord with humble heart and with joyful heart. As Psalms 100 says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. O Lord, our God, we praise your name this morning. As from all the generations of people, you choose us to be given privilege to come before you in your holy sanctuary to worship you. 
We praise your name, O oh God, for you show us your glory and your love through creation and especially through your holy scriptures. You reveal to us how you are the almighty God who calls to existence the stars and the moon, all the planets, the whole universe, but also a loving father who cares for us, your children. You reveal to us through your holy scriptures that even our sin and shame you redeem to, through the horrible death of your own begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise your name. We glorify you, but also acknowledging that we are all not always grateful to you. As your prophet says, we all have gone astray to our own ways, and often you are forgotten. Forgive us, Father, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us worship you with joyful heart today for tasting your heavenly kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. For all of us who are not only admiring God and praising him, but also humbly, sincerely confess our sins before him, only by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his apostle, St. Paul, once writing, to the Church of Rome and to all of us. As it is written until now in Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus and on the basis of his scripture, his gospel, we all are forgiven.
tomorrow morning at 6.45, there will be an Anzac service in the Warriors Chapel. It is a communion service and all are very welcome to attend. The Alpha course started yesterday and there were about 30 people at the course, some newcomers and many from the church there to welcome our newcomers and also refresh their faith and certainly it was a ro robust discussion in many groups. Next Sunday is Harvest Thanksgiving and if you would care to donate any food or perishables to the Harvest Thanksgiving display, following the service the food is taken to either the Mustard Seed Pantry in Gungarland or St John's Care at Reed. And I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who contributed over the Easter time. It was just a marvellous time for our church. Many, many visitors and we have had some wonderful feedback about the welcoming and the warmth of this church. So thank you to all the congregation. The Old Testament reading this morning is taken from Psalm 118, reading verses 14 to 29. You can find that in your order of service on the back page. Hear the word of God. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Hark, glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank thee that thou hast answered me and hast become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech thee, give us success. Blessed be he who enters in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will give thanks to thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. I give thanks to the Lord, for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
This morning's New Testament reading is from Acts chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. So Acts, and that can be found in the uh, uh, end of your order of service, or follow it in your Bibles. Acts chapter 5. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priests questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in his name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us? But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at the right hand as leader and saviour to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Last Sunday, as we all know, was Easter Sunday. It was a great day when we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus from the tomb. I have to say that I felt it was an even greater celebration this year because it was the first Easter since the onset of COVID-19. When we were able to worship together, without all the restrictions. Many of us can recall Easter Sunday two years ago when we weren't even able to meet at all face to face. Thankfully, this wasn't the case this year and hopefully never will be again. For those of you who were with us last Sunday morning, we had a memorable service Here in this church, there was a large attendance, great music and singing, and there was a great spirit of joy and hope amongst the people who shared in that time of worship. Most of us, particularly in our Presbyterian tradition, think that Easter is over for another year. But for Christians, Easter is not just one day in the year. Easter is a season that begins at sunset on the eve of Easter and ends with Pentecost, the day when we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. This extended Easter season gives us more time to ponder on the words that we love to say, or better still, shout, Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And it also enables us to celebrate the reality that we, as Christian people, and as members of the church, are the body of the risen Lord. I love the expression, we are Easter people. I often use it, not only at Easter time, but throughout the entire year. But if you think the resurrection was a one-time event that occurred in the dead body of the crucified Jesus, I want you to think again. Resurrection, which is God's wrenching of life from the grip of death, is continuous. But in the post-resurrection and ascension period, Jesus wasn't present in the world physically. 
By his Spirit, he was present among the disciples and ordinary men and women working wonders through them, turning the world upside down, as we read in Acts chapter 17 and verse 6. As you read through the book of Acts, it is evident that something is afoot. Trouble is brewing. The security forces are nervous. The world has been shaken. There has been an unnatural disaster, an unwarranted intrusion nobody expected. It is the resurrection of the crucified Jesus. It took little time to stir the Jewish high priest to jealousy. The Jewish officials recognize that the remarkable growth of the company of Christian believers is a potential threat to their own position of leadership. The people who had responded to the offer of the gospel were Jews in the main, and the religious hierarchy are now fearful lest their authority over so many is being undermined. They had threatened two of the apostles apparently without effect. They now decide on firmer methods of suppression. Not only the two, but all the apostles are arrested. The ruling party, being Sadducees, were particularly hostile to this new movement because it was based on belief in the resurrection. The Sadducees denied the possibility of resurrection and would see no reason to make an exception in the case of Jesus. The religious leaders hoping to keep a lid on any disruption breaking out, call a state of emergency. Peter and the other apostles are rounded up, and they are thrown into prison. But an angel delivers them and gives them a specific instruction. Acts 5 and verse 20. Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people the full message of this new life. That's resurrected life. The apostles are to continue witnessing not only in the city, but in the temple itself. In no more vivid, vivid way could the superiority of the authority of God over the authority of the temple officials be demonstrated. The apostles are to act with courageous defiance. They immediately obey the instruction, so the next morning they begin telling the people the good news about the resurrection. Soon after this, Peter and the apostles are hauled before the religious authorities again to account for their actions. This resurrection disruption must be quelled at all costs. After the religious leaders hear what Peter and the apostles have to say, they order them to shut up about Jesus and his resurrection. Verse 28, we give you strict orders not to teach in his name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the disciples, or apostles as they are referred to here, refuse to shut up. They defiantly answer, verse 29, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Peter tells the religious leaders in no uncertain terms that they are going to keep on telling people 
about Easter. They're going to keep on healing the poor without seeking any permission. They are going to keep on stirring up trouble in the towns and cities despite what the security forces may try to do in order to prevent them. Well, as you would expect, the religious leaders are enraged. Verse 33, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. These religious leaders saw the resurrection as a threat to their authority. Here's the irony in all of this. The good news of Jesus' resurrection is received as bad news by the religious authorities. Our lectionary reading from Acts chapter 5 shows that the resurrection of Jesus provokes a crisis in power. Who is really in charge? Where are we headed? Who holds the power? On this first Sunday after Easter, we are given the opportunity to reflect on the resurrection as a political challenge to the status quo, as someone once put it. This is a Sunday when we are reminded that the resurrection is not simply the raising of Jesus' dead body. The resurrection is a divine demonstration of authority and power, a divine challenge to all the powers that hold us in their grasp. The resurrection is not simply something that we might look forward to someday in the future. It is a statement about power and rule in 2022. The resurrection of the crucified Jesus is a demonstration of who God is, of who is in charge, and of where we are headed. The resurrection is not only a miracle, it is a glorious victory. Death, defeat, and sin will not have the last word after all. Even though that doesn't seem to be evident in our world today. In this passage in Acts 5, we discover that there is a power let loose in the world a power that God raises from the bottom up, a divine power for good that cannot be contained, accredited or channeled by the powers that be. Peter and the other apostles are showing the religious authorities that even though they think they are in control, they are, in fact, powerless. The Easter season is a time of good news and bad news. It is good news for all those who suffer under the heel of death-dealing authorities who oppress others under the delusion that somehow they are in charge. It may be a ridiculous thing to say this, but this is a time of good news for the people of Ukraine, particularly 
the Christians living in that country. How can this be, you ask? Many people have had to flee from their homeland. Many have been separated from their families. The last two months have brought nothing but pain and loss and destruction to many people in Ukraine. And yet for the Christian people there, they are able still to rejoice in the power of the resurrection that tells them who is ultimately in control. The Easter season is a time of bad news for those in the world, like Vladimir Putin, who have exchanged the disruptive, life-giving truth of Easter for the lordship of death. Let's take encouragement today from Peter standing before the authorities and taking his stand for the risen Christ. The authorities couldn't find a way to keep him and the other apostles quiet, not even by resorting to lock them up in the confinement of a prison. The powerful people who thought they were in control, had nothing but contempt for Peter's lack of education and refinement. As we read these words in our passage, we see the authorities nervously attempting to keep a lid on the commotion, trying to stop the disruption and dismissing the claims of the apostles as hysterical babblings of ignorant people who know no better. Here in Australia, we are in the middle of an election campaign. Maybe you're tired listening to it already. The various political parties and independent candidates are seeking your vote so that they can be elected to Parliament. Political parties, and that includes Australia, they want power. They want to be in control. They want to form government and rule. That's the way our democracy works. This is a good time for us to ask, who is in charge in Australia? Where are we headed as a nation? Who holds the power? Is it up there on the hill, within walking distance from where we're worshiping right now? Is it a bit, is it a bit far-fetched to suggest that the resurrection of Jesus is a political challenge to the status quo in Australia. Easter is presented in our passage from Acts as a vindication of poor and ignorant people by a God who acts on their behalf in the resurrection of Christ. Don't ever think that Easter is only one day in the year. We call it Easter Sunday. Easter is not even a season that lasts for a few weeks and then is over. 
Think of Easter this way. In the book of Acts, the resurrection is depicted as an explosion that propels Jesus' once disheartened followers in mission into all the world. Calvin Rowe has written a book on Acts. The title he gave it is this, Turning the World Upside Down. In the book, Calvin Rowe demonstrates that the resurrection, and here I quote, is the fount of new reality out of which the novum that is Christian mission emerges. The Latin word novum means new thing. The resurrection is not just an historical event that happened 2,000 years ago. It is a movement. It cannot be stopped. It causes disruption on its way. In the resurrection, Jesus, who has been raised from the tomb, is constantly on the move. I want you to, to believe that because it is true. I came across this statement the other day. The church, the missionary explosion into every corner of the world is all an aftershocks of the resurrection. We are still experiencing the aftershocks of the resurrection 2,000 years later. We are Easter people. I trust that we will go from this service this morning invigorated with the same boldness Peter and the apostles had when they rejected the Sanhedrin's restraining order. Speaking up for Jesus, witnessing for Him, even in our great country of Australia, will not be easy. I forecast it's going to get more difficult. But here's my point to you today. Don't be gagged talking about the resurrection. Keep on doing it. Let's face it. It will cause much disruption. Of course it will. But believe me, it will turn Australia upside down. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we praise your name for the opportunity again today in your special day to bring our offering to you. Father, we have to acknowledge that our offering today is not compatible to what you have given and is still giving us. But we ask you, humbly we ask you to receive and to bless this offering, Father, and use them through the hands that you have anointed for the glory of your name here in our church and even beyond. And teach us, Father, to give ourselves as living sacrifices to glorify your name all our lives. We pray only in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given himself for our salvation as the perfect offering to you. Amen. And now, beloved in Christ, while we're still standing, let us affirm our faith to God. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come now to our prayer, praying for others. Let's pray. Our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, as we come in prayer before you now, we recognise your sovereignty over all things in this world, your world. We feel overwhelmed as we pray for many difficult and distressing situations worldwide. We turn our hearts to Ukraine. We know the Russian military this week begun its long-awaited push to seize the east of Ukraine. Being aware that Syria and Libya have become involved too, we fear so much for the people of Ukraine. Lord, for those still fleeing, grant safe passage to any of the borders. We lift up those who have decided to stay, those in more remote areas, and we plead for safety for them. Please grant President Volodymyr Zelensky great courage, energy, and leadership skills in all that he does. And we pray that his family will remain safe. We pray for soldiers captured by the Russians and pray they'll be treated with some sense of humanity. Oh Lord, hear our pleas for these precious people and the country of Ukraine. We pray that supplies that are needed in Poland and Hungary will reach those who need help the most. And we pray for Reverend Granville Pillar and his wife Ebolia as they are very involved in Hungary serving the refugees there. It's a huge task and may they both be sustained and encouraged by you in this task. Lord Jesus, our hearts are heavy as we contemplate what is going on in Yemen's civil war, which has been going on now for seven years. War monitors estimate the conflict has killed over 14,500 civilians and has caused one of the world's worst humanitarian crises. Oh Lord, we pray that peace will soon be possible in Yemen. We ask that all the leaders involved in this war will sit down and say enough is enough. That all those parties involved will humble themselves and become determined to end this miserable situation. We pray for all those caught up in the takeover by the Taliban in Afghanistan. And whilst everybody is affected, Lord, we know that particularly the Christians are the main target for the Taliban. We pray they will find places of safety as they flee from village to village. Lord, please frustrate the wickedness that the Taliban will no doubt be plotting and let their plans for wickedness come to nothing. We pray for the, the Uyghur Muslims in the terrible indoctrination camps in China. We pray for justice to soon be done for these people. Help them, Lord, to be brave in such terrible circumstances. 
We commit to you the Anzac commemoration service here in the Warriors Chapel and other places tomorrow. We are so moved by those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. And Lord, for those Australians who in these days are in areas of conflict, we pray for your protection. Grant them grave, bravery and endurance. Lord, we pray for a smooth election campaign done decently and in order, and that the government of your choosing will be elected. Please be watchful over Mr Albanese, suffering currently with COVID. And Lord, we also pray for David Hurley and Linda in all their responsibilities, Lord. We ask you to grant them physical stamina and an ability to get through their very busy schedule. May they know, Lord, your support in all that they do and the support from us as their church. We also pray that our church's Alpha course will bless all who attend and that even though it started, that more will come. Please reveal to each of us who we can personally invite to the Alpha course. And lastly, we lovingly commit to your care those in our church who are unwell. Anne Logan, Ross Ramsey, Bruce Wheeler and Yolande Hickey. And we pray they'll be aware of your holy presence with them and will be sure in the knowledge that you are with them. Amen. And we'll now say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, beloved in Christ, may your soul has been refreshed by his word and strengthened by his spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Thank you. 